Well, welcome everybody. Um, as Lara said, my name is Sean Van Stratum. Um, I graduated Collins College in 2010. Um, did a multitude of different things, like worked at restaurants like Charlie Trotter's at the Peninsula Hotel and uh, also at the Viceroy Lamartage Beverly Hills. So now I am at Oakmont uh, Country Club as a food and beverage director, um, resident mixologist, I guess. I've co coined that myself and um, certified sommelier. So all things beverage, all things food, that's where I live and breathe. So welcome to our home. Um, so we did a nice little setup today for you to just kind of show you some of the ins and outs of uh, cocktail making. Um, so I'll just kind of preface the whole program here and um, break it on down. I'm going to go through the ingredients real quick so that um, I'm going to make some modifications to that so that if you don't have exactly everything that's in this recipe, you can kind of make it along the way. Um, second, I'm going to go through the history of the Mai Tai because it's a very interesting one and talk to you about kind of where it started and some kind of renditions that, of a Mai Tai that you've had now. And then we're gonna make it and we're gonna drink because cocktails can't be all that serious because we're drinking and having fun, right? Um, so I let my hair down, obviously, um, that you can see. So let's go ahead and get started. So you can see a wonderful little spread I have here, um, but I'm really only gonna be using kind of the ingredients right on this side. Um, so two things that you have to start out with is a really good decent rum and I'll talk about the deviation that I've used in this rum but I'm using Papa Pilar it's a three-year-old age blonde rum um, but you can choose any kind of aged rum that really has great flavor that's going to be the paramount of your cocktail uh, the second which is also kind of a variation that I'm changing in the recipe but as you've kind of also seen is going to be the um, aged rum or dark rum that's actually going to be put on top. So you have an aged rum and you have a dark rum that's on top. Um, the three other kind of liquors and sweet, sweetness are going to be uh, the orange curacao, which is very similar to kind of an orange flavor. We're going to have a, a, a guest come join us. Hey, what's up? Oh, say hi. Say hi. Are you going to help me make cocktails today? You can make a Shirley Temple maybe. Right? Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, let me see. How to show. And we're back. Commercial break. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, the, the orange curacao coming from the island of curacao, uh, they have a very fragrant um, uh, uh, citrus there. So if you don't have this, don't worry. You can substitute it out with Cointreau with a triple sec, anything that kind of has that orange flavored liqueur. The second kind of flavoring we're gonna have here is called Orjat. Um, we're using the, actually the Trader Vic's brand. You can use many different styles, but basically it's almond um, syrup. So with almond syrup, you can make your own. You can do a simple syrup and put just a drop of almond extract to give it that flavor if you don't have this ingredient. So those are kind of some modifications. And then the sugar that I'm using is uh, Demerara sugar. So essentially sugar in the raw, it's uh, unprocessed sugar. It gives it so much more flavor. And also, uh, sweating out here. Um, also, you can see how it's so much darker. We do two to one, so two times as much sugar to one part um, water. That just makes it much more concentrated, a little bit sweeter, so you don't have to use as much in the recipe. So those are kind of our roll call there for our ingredients. And obviously we have our fresh lime here that I'll be just squeezing right into the drink. And that's the last of our ingredient. Um, the glass that you'll need is just a rocks glass. Um, some of the equipment that you'll need, if you don't have a rocks glass, you can literally use anything kind of that shape and size. Um, you'll need a shaker set. Um, if you don't have this, you can modify it with, if you have like a, a pint glass and a solo cup, it can work as a shaker. So the fun part about being a bartender or bartending is that you have to be incredibly flexible and be able to go kind of in any direction. So I have a, a strainer here. Um, you won't need it because it's going to be a shake and dump cocktail, but just in case, it's always good to have. And then um, this is, we're going to squeeze the lime with this. However, obviously you could just squeeze it with your hands. Um, and then your jigger, so you measure everything out. Cool? So if you have all that, if you don't, go run and grab it, but let's get started. So um, history of the Mai Tai very quickly here to kind of run us through. So it was, it was created in 1944 by Victor J. Bergeron or Trader Vic, right? And um, 
that's when kind of the first Mai Tai was created. Uh, he started Trader Vic's in uh, Seattle in 1949, and then actually in Hawaii in 1950. Um, but why is it called a Mai Tai? So he actually had some friends uh, that were from Tahiti, and um, he was shooting around some ideas. And in Tahitian, Mai Tai Roai means the best in the world, um, or out of this world, the best, right? And Mai Tai being the best. So it stuck with him. He loved that kind of uh, mentality behind that. So he said, it is called a Mai Tai. Going on from there, um, in, in the 19, after the Great Depression and, um, and World War II, uh, the United States had a big kind of interest in the Polynesian culture. So you had a lot of tiki drinks really come about and become very, very poignant uh, for, for popularity. So in 1950, it was very close that between the United States and the rest of the world, that they almost ran out of rum. There was almost a rum shortage because these drinks, the Mai Tai and many others became so popular at that time. Um, this is where it changes. So these ingredients aren't what you typically maybe see in a Mai Tai. There's so many different types of Mai Tai. So this is where it starts to change in history. So in 1953, it was brought to Hawaii um, on the uh, Royal Hawaiian Hotel uh, and the various cruise ships. And they, they contacted Trader Vic to create a specialized Mai Tai recipe. So be, being that so many tourists were coming, they wanted to make it sweeter and more fruity. So that's where you see the introduction of pineapple juice and orange juice in a Mai Tai. Um, from there on, that's when things got a little weird, <laughs> but we'll get to that in a second. Um, you can see into the 60s and 70s, the Mai Tai were uh, really brought to the for forefront in media and also in um, politics. By 1961, Elvis had it prominently portrayed in uh, Blue Hawaii, as well as in around 1970, um, the Mai Tai became the official cocktail of the Nixon White House, uh, mainly because Trader Vic's uh, had a restaurant that was only like three blocks away from the White House at that time, and um, the Nixons w w frequented it quite a bit. So. It really had a big uh, kind of uh, forefront in the 50s all the way through the 70s. Um, into the 80s, that's where it got a little weird because cock just craft cocktail making in the 80s and 90s started to change. So any, instead of using everything from scratch, what they started doing is actually um, making these mixes. So margarita mixes and Mai Tai mixes. And some of those mixes, they're processed and they're not all fresh ingredients. So you see this really sweet kind of Mai Tai that starts. Um, also the mixture of rums, using light rum, dark rum, aged rum, just a various different uh, group of rums, kind of muddying those flavors of the traditional, uh, what, what um, Trader Vic traditionally used was a 17 year old um, rye and nephew, which was a Jamaican aged rum that had that really intense flavor. So if you're putting white rum and kind of mixing it, you're mudding those flavors. And also instead of floating, a dark rum on top, they just started floating grenadine and you would see with uh, cherries going there. So it really just became this whole different drink of where kind of Trader Vic started it to be. So into the 2000s, um, one just kind of prominent thing was in 2007, um, the, the uh, Merchant Hotel in Belfast, Ireland uh, sold a Mai Tai and was in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most expensive cocktail ever created. It's been uh, kind of beat by, by now, but it was a Mai Tai made with the original nephew and rye Jamaican rum made, produced in that same year that in 1944, that Trader Vic created the first Mai Tai. So it was, came from a, a legendary kind of seller of, of old spirits and liquors. And um, from there, it was a thousand, $1,475 for a cocktail. And they sold that, with, that, sold that bottle within the year uh, with those cocktails. So kind of interesting little note. Um, but that brings us to today. So we've kind of seen a resurgence in just the cocktail industry as a whole, um, going back to the basics. So really everybody with these craft cocktails are trying to find the true essence and the originality of where these drinks come from. And then the cool thing is then you can take it, once you understand really kind of the basis of that drink, then you can go forward and modify and change to your liking and to your taste. That makes it so fun. The way I think of bartending, it's so similar to the cooking side. And I've been in the kitchen too. I've, I've been a, a chef and a cook. And 
it's because you're using fresh ingredients, you're hand making each thing to order, um, and you can personalize it and you can customize it to make it closer to your liking. So let's get started. Um, I would like to make it towards the end if possible, and I didn't really clear this with anybody, but we'll see, um, to make it a little bit more interactive. So towards the end, after we make the cocktail, um, I would love to have like a little bit of a cocktail hour. We only have about 30 people or so, 36 online. So we'll, we'll see how that goes, but you can unmute yourself, ask questions and things like that. But uh, let's get started to make this cocktail. So like I said, I'm not using a 17 year old aged Jamaican rum. I'm using a, a blonde rum, which is somewhere between kind of an older aged rum and a white rum. So it provides a lot of flavor, but it still keeps the cocktail really fresh and light. So let's go ahead. Now let's talk about ice for one quick second. Um, what I'm using is crushed ice. You can use regular ice that you have. If you can do crushed ice, it's so much better. The reason is, People always think the more ice you have, the more your drink dilutes. And that's actually absolutely not true. The more ice you have, the colder the drink stays and therefore it doesn't dilute as far. But also Mai Tai is mainly three different alcohols together. So you do wanna sip on this and to have more ice in there, it will dilute over time, not as quickly, but it will offer a little bit more um, water into the cocktail. So it's kind of a double, double play into that. So you're gonna always fill up your big tin with the ice and your small tin with the liquor. Because as we know with bartending and things, you're gonna have maybe a server come up and ask a question. You're gonna have a member or a guest pull you away. And now what your drink is doing is just sitting there diluting, right? So keeping them separate offers you a chance to run in the house, grab something, come back, and your drink is still intact, right? Because as soon as alcohol hits ice, it starts to melt instantly. So let's go on down through. So I'm gonna mix up kind of this, um, the way we do this, because I like to do the syrups and the juices first. And this is also another bartending technique. If you go in with the alcohol first and you make a mistake, well, then you have to throw out the drink or you'll, you as the home bartender will have to drink it, which maybe that's not bad, but if you make too many mistakes, you won't wake up in the morning. Um, so what you wanna start with is the juices, and kind of this side first, and then we'll go with the alcohol last. So let's grab your lime, and I'll do this real slow. We'll just kind of walk on through this, um, but you're gonna squeeze your lime right into here. If you're using already fresh squeezed lime juice, you're gonna do three fourths of an ounce, but um, I'm gonna go right in with this one, just like that. And that gives you about three fourths of an ounce. Um, even if you're using one of these kind of juice presses, I always still give it another squeeze because there's about a half ounce of juice still left in there. So once that's done, don't throw this away, okay? Keep that lime, spent lime, because that's gonna come into the play with the garnish, okay? So once we have our lime juice in there, we're gonna start going right down this um, path here. It's gonna be a half ounce of the dry curacao. Again, like I said, if you don't have dry curacao, feel free to use a Cointreau, um, it's something like a triple sec to give it that same orange flavor background. So we're gonna do a half ounce there. Okay, that goes in. And I like to see some people are following along. That's awesome. <laughs> um, the orgeat is the almond flavored syrup uh, that we're gonna use. This does not have any alcohol in it. The um, dry curacao is actually 40% alcohol. Um, so that is adding an additional alcohol component to it. But um, one fourth of an ounce that is needed of the orgeat. Okay. And then that really rich demerara sugar, uh, we're gonna do a half ounce as well. So you have your sweetness coming from the syrups and then, and also a little bit of sweetness from the dry curacao. Um, but then you have the citrus component to balance those coming from the lime, okay? Now we're gonna go with our spirit. We're gonna go with two ounces of our rum. So if you're using the aged rum should be here, the dark rum will go last. And I'll show you how to do a float. Okay, there we go. So now here comes the super fun part. It's the shake. So we're gonna put up some ice and we're gonna shake this thing. 
Oh yeah. Sorry, I'm not even looking at that stuff. Um, somebody liked my hair. I like I like you too. Um, so yeah, Grand Marnier would be a great substitute as well. It's anything kind of orange flavored liqueurs um, or not so much spirits. So don't get into the weird artificially flavored spirits because that's going to throw off your cocktail. Anything natural and fresh and light, but that's a good call. We're going to fill up our shaker quite a bit here. And this is the fun part. So you have all your cocktail in here. We have our glass set and ready. Then we're going to go like that. Now, when you put this on, you always need to give it a little tap on the back. That just locks these two together so that they don't freak out on you. Um, so a couple of different ways to shake. If you're kind of starting out and you wanna just shake it just right here, that's perfect. It gives you a little bit more lift and more aeration if you kind of go an up and down shake, right? And and then you can also go right in front of you. But either way, whatever you do, basically, it should get so cold, you can't hold on to it. Until your hands are icy, that's a perfect drink, okay? Um, to get them off, you wanna just do a little tap on the side, because sometimes they get stuck. Mine gets stuck a lot more, okay? And now the fun part is, this is just a dump, uh, shake and dump cocktail. So you don't need to strain anything. You're gonna go right into there. You see it's nice and frothy. So there's a little bit left in there. That'll be for your bartender. <laughs> also, you have to taste your cocktails just like you taste your food, right? So let's finish this cocktail. All right, so we're gonna have our mint here. And don't forget, you still got that lime, right? So this is a really cool garnish. No cherries, no freaking grenadine, no weird stuff in this. This is just a really fresh, fun cocktail. So because this has kind of come from the islands, comes from the, you know, Polynesia, from, from uh, Hawaii, what the, the original garnish was is this is an island, right? And then you're going to take your mint, and this is going to become your palm tree. Well, that's nasty mint. Yeah, that's a better piece. So what I like to do is you take a good amount, right? A good amount of mint. And what you want to do is put it all together like this. And then you just slap it against the back of your hand. Okay, just a couple times. And smell that. It's so fragrant, right? That's where all of this wakes up in this cocktail. So you're going to put it right here next to your little island. So you have your palm tree and your island. And then you're just gonna do the float on top. And this is the same Papa Pilar. This is a 24 year old dark rum. And then you're gonna just see it change a little bit. It's a little high, Ooh, a little full. I know I gotta take a sip. And if you do it right, you'll see this beautiful separation right there on the top of, of the the float of the dark rum. And the coolest part is when you take a sip of that, you get this really, really intense, rich flavor of the dark rum. And then you get hit with this freshness from the light rum and the mixture of everything below it. But the biggest thing is you get that beautiful aroma of mint um, right at, as you take a sip of it. So you take a sip on this side, but your nose goes right into the bouquet of mint and you're smelling the mint. There's no mint in the cocktail as you've seen, but it gives you, it plays with what's on your palate and also what you're sensing um, aroma wise. Cheers. <laughs> oh, so good. Yeah. I need a hot day. <laughs> so this is kind of like halfway through. So um, I want to make this halfway uh, a cocktail training, but then also a halfway just kind of a fun kickback uh, way to, to connect over Zoom. So um, I don't know if they're, they're able to, um, but this is something I've done with my club too. Um, if you can't unmute yourself, that's fine. Just literally, if you have a question, if you wanna say something, just raise your hand. Um, and then I'm sure Diana can come around and unmute you. Yeah, I can't unmute. I'm gonna ask BJ a question if you don't mind. 
Oh, I know, I know. She's saying, oh, no, no, don't do it, don't do it. What? Now, saying, now you're going to get me in trouble. Yep, now you're on. You're unmuted. So, of course I am. Um, I want to know where the Have you ever are seen, you? come on. Are you at Trader Vic's? Like, are you, like, hanging out? Just, no, like, okay. in a cabana somewhere? I am, this is my <laughs> screen down so you can see the sound. This so, is no, my, no. my law, and I'm in orange, and, and what? That is a beautiful bar. I just well, have to say, so Conti pass that on. This is the Contiki bar. I know. Hey, oh, I, <laughs> and so this is the Contiki bar. And because uh, uh, Rod, my brother-in-law, is a diehard Disney fan. As a matter of fact, they had dinner with uh, Mary Niven yesterday. And um, this is his creation because both of them are geniuses. Come on over, Sean. Yeah. Over in <laughs> I'm <laughs> coming right now. I'm going to finish the cocktail. I'll be there. <laughs> Tuesday, um, cocktails. Also, I want to call on uh, Kelly Min. So you guys made the cocktail. I want to know how it went. They're going to unmute you in a second. Yeah, go ahead. Fantastic. How did it go? Fantastic. This will be our repertoire from now on. Yeah. <laughs> and the fun thing is, once you know how to make this cocktail, it's relatively simple. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you use fresh ingredients like fresh lime and and you can even make your syrup yourself. It's very simple. I literally made this today by putting hot water and sugar just in the bottle, wrapping a towel around it and shaking it, and you make that sugar syrup. So I'm glad you had a great time. Okay, I'll fix it later. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Margie. Oh, she typed it. What is your favorite cocktail for hot weather? Um, well, this is a great one. Um, me personally, I love two really fun drinks because I love tequila in hot weather. Um, it just reminds me of a good time. <laughs> but um, so, so a great margarita, if you make a, just a standard margarita, but again, no mixes, anything, just literally uh, tequila base. If you want a little bit more flavor, you can go to Reposado or Añejo, but just even a Blanco is great. Lemon, or I'm sorry, lime agave, a bit of Cointreau, uh, shake and dump that. But what I like to change about that is just float a little bit of mezcal on top and it totally changes the cocktail. You get this really smoky note on the nose, but as you stir it with the cocktail, it becomes a little bit more of the background. When you have full on mezcal drinks, sometimes it could be a little overpowering, um, but a same twist on that, if you like margaritas, what a uh, really fun one I've been doing um, by Lynette Moreno, in um, New York City is she made a cocktail called the Siesta. And essentially it's the same base as a margarita. Um, two things change. You add grapefruit juice and you also add in Campari. And it's a shaken cocktail served in a martini glass up. Um, and it's so delicious. If you like that kind of Negroni uh, bitter notes uh, to your cocktail, but still you wanna keep it fresh and fun and light, it's an awesome summertime warm weather cocktail. And again, if you like that smoky mezcal, just the float on top uh, really sends it over the top and, and makes it kind of a complete balanced cocktail. So great, great question. Oh my God, my favorite question. What is the difference between mezcal and tequila? So uh, mezcal can be a tequila, but I'm sorry. Yes, mezcal, uh, I always get it wrong. Tequila can be, mezcal. no, mezcal is a tequila, but tequila is not a mezcal. Yes, I got that one. So the reason is tequila is made in a very similar fashion. So you take the, um, the pina or the blue agave plant and essentially cut all the, the sides off and it looks like a pineapple. And what you do is then roast those. And um, then after roasting it, you shred it. You basically cook it and you're making somewhat of like a beer, closer to a beer. Um, it ferments, alcohol is formed and then it's distilled. Um, but it has no, none of that smoky flavor notes to it. However, when they do mezcal, they do the same thing. Usually they take single varieties of blue agave. Um, so like Espadine or there's different ones in the high mountains and things like that. Um, but they'll actually roast them. So they burn charcoal and wood in this giant pit, chop all the piñas in half, they throw them in, they cook them, um, by covering them basically kind of with a fireproof tarp and then lots of dirt. And they literally cook them for five to seven days. And they're underground 
in this kind of smoldering fire. So once they pull all that out, they do the same method and then they take all of those piñas, they shred them and they make uh, the, the kind of mash, if you will, and, and distill it. But from there, you're left with all that smokiness that came from that cooking process. Um, instead of just roasting them in an oven or boil them raw, you have this really intense smoky note. So that's where mezcal just really kind of, um, it's an acquired taste. Like if you like scotches, it's this difference between a Highland and an Islay scotch where the Islas can be like Laphroaig, really like burning tires and asphalt. Like that's not a great way to describe anything, but that's literally what it, tastes, uh, it smells like. Um, so mezcal is like that kind of same version. But if you go to Mexico, anywhere, pretty much any village, they're drinking mezcal over tequila. Bigger export is the tequila outside of the country, but the, the biggest one consumed would be mezcal in Mexico. So good question. So if you've been to Honolulu, and, my guy, what are your, um, I'll read the question. If you've been to Honolulu and uh, had their Mai Tai, what are your thoughts? What's the biggest difference between Mai Tai you've noticed from place to place? I've noticed they tend to have a mimosa flavor to them. Well, the main difference uh, between kind of your traditional Mai Tai and maybe any other renditions is the addition of juice other than lime juice. So anytime that they're gonna have <laughs> orange juice or pineapple juice, it's gonna totally change the flavor profile of that cocktail. Because as you can see, this is really just spirits mixed with syrup um, and a little touch of the lime. So if you've had them in different ways, if, you've, if they're more red in color, that's coming from usually grenadine and um, uh, cherries. So there, there's various different ways to make them, but no way is wrong. Um, even like here, I, I've deferred from um, uh, Trader Vic's original recipe because I like it with the, the aged rum or the dark rum float, like a Myers dark rum or, or I'm using Papa Pilar, but that gives it just a really intenseness and deepness of flavor. So great question. Did I miss anything else? I think I got all of them. Cool. But uh, yeah, so I'll just talk a little bit quickly of kind of how we came upon this, um, this whole kind of cocktail class over Zoom, all this stuff. So um, at Oakmont Country Club, we had a really fun story and I'll take a sip because I'm thirsty. Um, so at Oakmont Country Club, you know, with um, everything locking down and closing down in March, um, due to COVID-19 and the pandemic, um, we had to be very quick on our feet to change and adjust because we, we weren't, we're not a, a, a you know, for-profit restaurant or a club. We're, we're an equity club for our members. So we really work regardless for our members. And we instantly, on the switch of a dime, we went into a takeout program, similar days of the week that we are open, Tuesday through Sunday, um, they would pick up in the evening, so order during the day and pick up at night. The amazing part of that was that we changed the menu literally every week um, to show our guests that we're, we're, we're rolling with the times, and we made the menu larger and larger. So when we did open up, um, we, we were able to kind of welcome them back and do it all in person. But there was a long period of time between end of March and maybe middle May to June even of opening up, and I had to fill the time. So I had to keep members engaged. So we did 10 different uh, virtual events over the month of May. And that was to keep everyone engaged and keep them focused and keep them knowing that Oakmont is caring for them. And we're trying to do our best to, to have everybody as close as possible in that community. So um, what we started was these cocktail clubs. And I think the first one we did, maybe 30 people, and I sell them as a kit. Um, so it's different because we could actually, through the ABC laws, we could actually sell cocktails to go with some small food items. So we did three different luxury bar snacks that paired with each of the cocktails. So the Mai Tai was one of them where we had just uh, candied, uh, candied uh, macadamia nuts, which were great because it has that really rich fattiness um, with the sweetness, which is really kind of like the cocktail that ro robustness um, that comes from a Mai Tai. So when we started that, my members freaked out and they loved it so much. They were like, when's the next one? We got to have another one. So I literally did one every two weeks with three to four different cocktails and they just were out of this world. So one of them asked me when we opened up, they said, hey, you should like do this in person, like when we're here. And I was like, well, it's kind of hard because like, look at all the stuff you need. You got to be able to dump 
cocktails you need, ice, like if we sit in a room, like I'm gonna have to buy all this equipment. And then also beside all that, how are you gonna get home after three and four cocktails? Like you're gonna be lit in an hour. So um, I think we, you better stay at home and do Zoom. So <laughs> it really worked out well. We did some wine events um, where, where we did tastings and dinners. So this has just been really fun. I think this time um, has to be about um, uh, taking every bit of experience that you have and mashing it all together because the most creative person wins in this time right now with so many hospitality uh, workers and, and staff and, and various careers being just thrown to the wayside uh, due to this pandemic, I think we have to step up to the plate and really have things like this that keep people engaged. And, and it's fun, you know, fun creating these things and, and having this kind of um, this platform. But I literally feel like I'm on a TV show sometimes. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I think there's another question. So most guests, re, uh, most guests requesting Mai Tais uh, when, I, when I bartend are used to be fruitier versions. So now I'm aware of how they make the traditional Mai Tai. How would you suggest to modify the recipe to cater to both? Absolutely. So one, don't use a mix because what you can then do is shift and change these things. So I have members at the club that don't like this Mai Tai and that's okay. Um, I know Lara at the beach club, she has her my beach club Mai Tai and don't you dare change that or they will come for you. So, and it has fruit juice in it and it has all these different things and like fruit juice from concentrate, but like, don't you change the recipe because that's the recipe, right? So I think being able to know your members and know your guests and to switch on the drop of a hat is the best way to do it. So if they like it fruitier, don't deprive them from orange juice and pineapple juice. juice. But if you want to do those juices, literally squeeze an orange and juice a pineapple. Like make everything as fresh as possible and every drink will be amazing. So fresh juices really seal the deal with a cocktail. Um, so that's, that's definitely my advice there. Um, Cool. Yeah, awesome questions. But I think I, I should mention I'm bartending at weddings with a limited rum selection, um, Bacardi and Myers. So you could still do a float with Myers dark rum. Um, and, and like I said, it's not bad to do the base with like a light rum like Bacardi, like a white Bacardi rum, um, if you're doing that float on top, because that's going to balance it. I'm giving you kind of like in a perfect world scenario. But like I said, you can make mod modifications all across the board. You could do white rum, Bacardi, and Myers dark rum. And like I said, even a combination of this, if you wanted to knock the, the almond syrup out, you can. And you could just do Grand Marnier and simple syrup, and you would have a similar effect of the Mai Tai. So don't feel that just because you don't have this in a bartending situation or at home that you can't make it because essentially this is a daiquiri. A daiquiri is what? Rum, lime, and sugar more or less. So you've added a few other ingredients to make it a little bit more rich and kind of enjoyable. But it's just like cooking when you have a recipe that you need to follow, but then, oh, I don't have um, basil for the pesto, but hey, can you do it with mint and parsley? Like then it totally flips it on its head and that might be something even better than what you were intending to come out with uh, originally anyway, so cool. Well, any other questions, if you have for me, um, I'd love to answer them, but I, I am quite parched. So I'm, you're just gonna watch me sip on this real quick. <laughs> so cheers. What is a Disney Mai Tai? The happiest place on earth? Um, well, Disney is, is the it? happiest place on earth, but Correct. Disney Mai Tai is... Which one? Oh, wait, hold on. It's, ah, here is the recipe for the Disney Mai Tai. Rod, you want to tell them the story behind the Disney recipe? Okay. There's this. It's from Club 33. It's, Club, it's from Club 33, so we're using Club 33 oh, wow. glasses. And oh, my God, you're so fancy. No, that's my brother-in-law. <laughs> my sister married up. <laughs> bougie. My, my sister I know, but you're, you, you're still <laughs> so, enjoying yeah. it. I have, I have, I have no idea. I'm just, but thank you for this opportunity. You're the star bartender, the the guest bartender. No, you are. 
<laughs> awesome. Well, cool. Um, so yeah, if you haven't noticed, this shirt just got it at Ross. It has cocktails on it. <laughs> I'm so proud of it. And um, yeah, this has uh, been really fun, really cool. Um, I usually do like four cocktails in an hour. So this has been really relaxing for me, <laughs> what I'm used to. Um, but definitely feel free to reach out to me. Um, we're coming up with things left and right um, in, in, at Oakmont. So I love to share any of this with you if, if you're in various different industries. I know the, the hotel and you know, uh, independent restaurants have been hit the hardest uh, through this. And those are the ones that aren't really bouncing back so quickly. Um, but definitely in the club world, I think there's so much to be uh, created and fostered, um, especially with members being so hungry to do anything. And really, if you're, if you're still running restaurants and you're still open and, and those things, the same thing applies. Your regular guests will still support you even through all of this, um, but you have to push the envelope. And I think um, if you keep keep fo focused on those things and being creative and, and giving back to your guests, you'll, you'll see that in a return. And I think we've seen that in a lot of different places in hospitality. So I am thirsty too. Can I say something, <laughs> Sean? Yes, of course. This is uh, Leah. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that, that Sean and Lyra are going to be our, uh, in our innovation speaker series. And they're going to be talking about innovations that um, are going on in their clubs and uh <laughs> the ways they're they're dealing with COVID-19 and all that kind of stuff and it is um September 14th which is a Monday night and it's at 6 p.m and uh hopefully Diana will be able to send out the information to all alums uh we want everybody to join I, I'm excited to hear what you guys are going to have to say that evening we're going to have a lot of students probably um most of our <clears throat> intro to hospitality students will be there and we'll have of course, sophomores, juniors, seniors, everybody. So it should be a lot of fun. So I'm mean, very excited about it. I just wanted to give a shout out and say, please join us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for that. It's, it's really fun, um, especially <laughs> being in this household <laughs> together because we're literally running uh, programs at both of our clubs. And um, the, the greatest part about us being in this relationship too is that we can always come home and we bounce the ideas off each other and, and she usually just steals my ideas and then has me do this at her club which I've done a few different times um, but that's you know that's what what you marry up right <laughs> um, but anyway no th this is uh this is great and and we, we just enjoy it so much and especially doing it this is our first kind of setup in our backyard and I think it worked out pretty well um, so we'll, we'll keep it going but thanks for all the questions and and everything please uh, hit up Di Diana or myself if you have any other follow-up questions and um, go make some good cocktails and use some fresh juices and like uh, be creative it's a it's a great road <laughs>